The Crow's Nest Pass, carved by giant glaciers in the shadows of the Rocky Mountains of Western Canada. The valley's first inhabitants are hunters who have little use for the seams of black rock exposed on the riverbanks. But it is coal that brings the railway to the crow's nest and seduces immigrant settlers with the promise of a new life. Between 1901 and 1915, the Crow's Nest Pass becomes one of the largest coal producing areas in Canada. It is also one of the deadliest. By 1914, mining is the lifeblood of the Crow's Nest Pass, its leading industry, but there are risks. Between 1902 and 1913, more than 150 men are killed in mine explosions across the crow's nest. The Hillcrest mine, however, remains untouched, considered the safest in the pass. By June 1914, there are 377 men on the payroll and a thousand people living in this close-knit community. Most of the men are married and earn an average of $125 a month. The men that worked in the underground mine at Hillcrest came from all over the place, um, down in, from eastern Canada. They were hometown boys from the communities around the Crow's Nest Pass area, some men from the United States. They had traveled to Canada looking for a better future. They came from a lot of countries that were impoverished. They didn't have much chance. They'd lost their homes, their farms, so they came to Canada looking for a new life. Coal mining itself usually took place during the day shift. Uh, most of the men that worked in the evening shifts were doing repairs, fixing the timbers that braced the walls of the mine, just checking and making sure everything was safe. That's exactly what fire boss Daniel Briscoe is doing on the evening of June 18, 1914. He finds an accumulation of methane gas and coal dust in several sections of the mine. Ventilation is good, however with enough moisture to reduce the danger of explosion. Word is sent to the miners to be ready for work the following morning, Friday, June 19th. At that time, the Hillcrest mine had been closed down for two days, the Wednesday and Thursday before, because they'd overproduced. So most of the men had had a couple of days off, which were nice for them. They were just heading back to work on the Friday morning at about 7 a.m. There was about 237 men that were scheduled to work underground that day. John Davison and his son John Jr. joined the group as well. After emigrating from England, John Sr. worked the Spring Hill mine before moving west to Hillcrest. My grandfather started in, in the oil, he was mining in the old country, and my dad lost his older brother in the collieries over there in, in a mine accident and uh, before they come out to this country. And then when they come out here, my grandfather, he carried on with mining. My dad started in the mines as a, he used to pump air up the slant to where the, the miners were working. David Murray is there that morning proud to be working alongside his three sons. Charlie Ellick is there too. 11 years earlier, he was one of the 17 miners trapped by the Frank Slide. Not long after, he moved to Hillcrest because of the mine's good reputation. His wife is expecting the birth of their third child any day now. The men that worked in the underground mine at Hillcrest came from all over the place. They had traveled to Canada looking for a better future. They came from a lot of countries that were impoverished. They didn't have much chance. They'd lost their homes, their farms, so they came to Canada looking for a new life. Most of the men that were working there were fairly young. The, the youngest boy there that day was only 17. The oldest man that day was only 54. 
And in between, most of the men were early 20s, late 20s. By 645 that morning, the men are approaching the lower level of Hillcrest Mine. Those working above ground go to their workstations. The rest check in with timekeeper Robert Hood. Each man is assigned two numbered brass tags that identify him in case of an accident. One he keeps with him. The other hangs on a pegboard in the timekeeper's office. Hillcrest consists of two mines. A 365-meter slant takes miners to the tunnels of mine number one. To the south, the slant for mine number two descends some 730 meters underground. It is linked to slant number one by two intersecting tunnels, levels one and two south. The third main section is level one north. Just after seven, the superintendent is the first to enter the mine. He is followed by a team of Bratismen. It is their job to maintain the flow of air through the shafts. Giant fans at the two entrances move air through tunnels and passageways. None of the miners wear oxygen masks, so the fans are vital to their safety. Once the mine is deemed safe, the superintendent gives the go-ahead. The miners follow him in. John Davidson and his son arrive at the same shaft, but split up to work in different areas. When they went into the mine, my grandfather went to the left down this other shaft, and my dad went farther down into the mines and over to the right, and to over towards the number two shaft. 8 a.m. Fire boss Sam Charlton sets off a number of charges near slant one to expand the tunnels leading deeper into the mine. Married less than a month, he takes no chances. When he's not setting charges, he keeps his battery and firing cable in separate places. 9 a.m. Eight more miners check in at the timekeeper's office, but two are turned away. Robert Hood smelled alcohol on their breath and he wouldn't let them go underground. Now, little did they realize that by stopping and having a few shots of whiskey in the morning, they were going to save their lives that day. In the town below, it's time for school. Most of the children hurrying to class have fathers, brothers, or uncles who are now deep inside the mountain. 9.30 a.m. 235 men are below ground. Sam Charlton prepares charges in Tunnel 32. Engineer Alex May has just inspected the giant electric intake fan at the mouth of Hillcrest No. 1. He is on his way to inspect the steam-driven exhaust fan at mine No. 2. As Alex May gets to his feet, he sees brown smoke pouring from the ventilation shaft. The intake fan is no longer moving. They knew from working underground for years and years and years that what was going to happen after that initial blast was that the fire was going to eat up all the oxygen inside the mine and leave behind what the men referred to as after damp, which is a deadly mixture of carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide that would kill a man quite quickly if he was left underground. The entrance to mine number one is a mass of fallen rock, broken timbers, and demolished mine cars. There is no way in and no way out. The mine whistle begins to blow. As the whistle of the Hillcrest mine roars through the surrounding valley, desperate family members come running. The families that were left behind in the town of Hillcrest would know immediately what was going on when they heard the mine whistle blowing the way they did. And they could see the brown smoke cloud moving up into the air from the town site as well. It was just bedlam when this explosion happened and that everybody, wives and mothers, raced up to the mine entrance 
to see if their, was it their sons, their husbands, their fathers were safe. In the terrifying darkness, one of those sons, John Davison Jr., searches frantically for a way out. Two men that were with my dad, two miners that had been picking coal while he was up in there, they uh, come along and they had to crawl on, on their hands and knees. They were holding onto a railway track because they couldn't see it. Everything was out, lamps and everything were all out. So as they wandered through the tunnels, they were coming across other men that had been killed and some of them quite brutally, uh, they came across other men that had already been taken over by the after damp. It's hard to imagine what it must have been like for them in that darkness to pass somebody that they had worked with for years and have to leave them behind. It's hard to fathom what it must have been like to be a young man caught in a situation like that. Within 20 minutes of the blast, 16 miners make it to the surface. 16 out of 235. Most of the men that survived from the Hillcrest mine were the men that were lucky enough to be working fairly close to the number two mine entrance. They said that they felt a concussion, a wind hitting them, and they weren't quite sure what had happened, but they knew something had happened underground. And they made their way to the entrance and they stumbled out. One of them is David Murray, frantically searching the blackened faces of the men beside him. He realized that none of his three sons were there. At that time, he panicked, and he turned to go back in the mine. When the men, the mounted police tried to stop him, he was in such a panic because none of his sons had made it. But he fought them off, and he ran back into the mine entrance, and he actually did not survive the Hillcrest Mine disaster either. It is just after 10 a.m. An emergency hospital is set up in the mine yard. Oxygen masks arrive and are sent down to rescue crews. Outside, the waiting crowd is close to panic. With oxygen masks, search parties probe deeper into the mine, but rescue attempts are hit and miss. Rescue workers are able to send a group of miners from level one north safely to the surface. One of them is John Davison, but not the John Davison everyone expects. They walked all the way from the number two mine entrance down to the number one mine entrance. And the report was that my dad had been killed. But when they got down there, then they found out it was my grandfather that was killed. They brought him out, and his mustache was singed a little on the other side and uh, along his... Uh, his uh, hair along the side of his head there was just cinched on the end. But other than that, there was not a mark on him. It was just the, the concussion and, the, and then, of course, the gas would get to him. And uh, that's what killed him. He was 44 years of age. Confused by the smoke and the complicated maze of passageways, surviving miners arrive at the entrance to mine number one. They find it hopelessly blocked. They turn and head back toward the other entrance. The after damp hunts them down one by one. Because of the way the explosion had taken place, it was very confusing for them. They traveled through the mine, and as they were moving from where they were located or where their station was inside the mine to where they could have gotten out, there was, they were met by black, brown clouds of dust that indicated that the after damp was in that direction. By now, only 26 bodies have been recovered. One of them is David Murray, overcome by lethal gases while searching for his sons. None of his boys will make it out alive. By 12 o'clock on that day, Friday, all of the men who were going to live from the Hillcrest Mine disaster had gotten out. And after that, it seemed to be a strange calm that fell across the people that were on the outside of the mine. They realized at that time that the chances of seeing their loved ones come up from under the mine alive were very slim. When rescue workers finally punch a hole into mine number one, they find a grim picture of death and destruction. Bodies burned and disfigured beyond recognition. 
others frozen in a final death pose, so many more relentlessly pursued, then choked to death by the black damp. Out of the 235 men that went underground in the coal mine that day, only 46 of them got out of the mine alive that day. So 189 men in all were killed in the Hillcrest mine disaster, making it the worst mine disaster in Canada's history. Everybody that lived in the area was either related to or very close to somebody that was killed inside the mine. There was over 130 women who lost their husbands that day and over 400 children, mostly under the age of 10, who lost their fathers that day. So in a small community, a thousand people in the small town of Hillcrest, it was just felt everywhere throughout the Crosnes Pass area. Sunday, June 21st, 1914. In the Crow's Nest Pass, it is uncharacteristically cold for early summer. In the community of Hillcrest, a grim procession carries 150 wooden coffins to the local cemetery. It was snowing that year in June, which is hard to imagine. And they had several services that took place. There was a Roman Catholic service, there was an Anglican service. And after that, they loaded the coffins up onto the wagons and they proceeded down the small, through the streets of the small town of Hillcrest to the cemetery. And as if they hadn't gone through enough, as they were moving down the streets of Hillcrest, a couple of the horses spooked. And they knocked the caskets out of the back of the wagon and the bodies that were contained in those caskets fell out. And when you read about that event, the people must have been so immune to any more pain at that time. It said they didn't really show a whole lot of shock. They picked the men up, they put them back on the wagons, and they continued in the procession. The men were buried in mass graves. They were laid two by two, about a foot apart, and all 150 of them were laid to rest that day. The last man who was killed at the Hillcrest mine site wasn't found until two weeks after the initial blast took place. So they said that there were small funeral processions occurring down the streets of Hillcrest almost daily after the initial one took place on June the 21st. John Davidson Sr. is one of the dead. And so is Charlie Ellick, the Frank Slide survivor, whose luck has finally run out. When they brought all them bodies out, my mother couldn't even recognize them. They were all burnt. They just lay, laid them side by side, and she didn't even know which was him. My stepfather bought this monument to him and put placed it on in, in the graves. So they didn't know if it was on his body or who. But. Charles's family was not very lucky when it came to Hillcrest. Well, I was born the next day after the explosion. And we lived in a tent, eh? We lived in a tent, three girls and two boys. And I was in bed with my mother, and then the big storm come up, a windstorm, and there, there was a big fir tree just beside uh, the tent. And it blew over and fell, just missed me and my mother in bed. So in two days, Mrs. Elick buried her husband, had a baby, and lost her home. There wasn't a family that was untouched, you know. There was always somebody lost a son or a father or a husband. But it, it was a really bad time to hear my dad explain it anyway. Ethel's own father is saved by fate that morning at Hillcrest. He had been scheduled to work the day shift. But his friend called him and asked him to change shifts because his friend's wife was coming in later that afternoon and he wanted to meet her at the train. So my dad changed with him and this man was in the explosion and saved my dad's life because of this change. I don't know what it was, whether it was God's will that did this, had him change shifts with my dad because he wanted my dad to live. My dad says there was no way to explain it. No way to explain it. The cause of the Hillcrest explosion is uncertain. Some put it down to a spark from a miner's pick, 
a faulty lamp, or inadequate safety standards. It remains a mystery to this day. The Hillcrest mine didn't close down because of the Hillcrest mine disaster. They actually reopened, continued coal mining, and it didn't take them very long to, to again reach their peak production, which was about 2,000 tons of coal a day. The mine continued operating right up until the 19, late 1930s when it finally closed down production. Today, the community of Hillcrest still survives, but not as it once did. Now, it is part of the municipality of Crow's Nest Pass, an amalgamation of several mining towns in the area. The Hillcrest Cemetery that marks one of Canada's greatest tragedies has been designated an historic site, but it also stands as a memorial to those who survived and chose to carry on. Most of the families stayed in this area. Whether they stayed at Hillcrest or moved on to other coal mines throughout the area, they did stay, and that's really what our communities are built on, are those people that were here initially and lived through those types of tragedies. <laughs>